Well, my friends, it's uh, my pleasure to open this webinar. This is the third episode of our uh, uh, sport arbitration uh, uh, seminars, which are promoted by CPMA uh, and also, I mean, the, the Brazilian Chamber of Mediation and Arbitration, and also, and very especially, the Arbitration Channel, right? For this specific uh, episode, we do have the support of the Loyola Marymount University, Loyola Law School, uh, in which uh, one of our speakers, Professor Faraz Shahalei, uh, is an adjunct professor. So I would like, first of all, to uh, uh, express my gratitude to Professor Daniel Brantes Ferreira, who is the general director of this uh, series, and also uh, to our friend, uh, uh, Professor Faraz Shalai, again, who is our general coordinator. Thanks, for us. Thanks, Daniel. And very especially my friend, Lauro Parente, and your uh, uh, team at the Arbitration Channel. Thanks a lot for all the support and effort to put this episode together, right? Uh, without uh, further ado, uh, we will just introdu uh, introduce, uh, I mean, uh, uh, present the speakers, right? So we do have uh, with us today, Dr. Daniela Hurd. She's a researcher at the IMC Asser Institute at The Hague, right? And consultant on sports and human rights. Uh, we do also have Professor Elias Bantekas. He's an arbitrator, professor of Hamad bin Khalifa University and adjunct professor of law at Georgetown University as well. Uh, professor Faraz Shahalai, who's an adjunct professor of law at Loyola Law School, Los Angeles, right? And we will be talking about basically CAS and sport organizations in light of the uh, Semenya judgment of the uh, European Court of Human Rights, right? So, uh, as you probably know, a lot can be said about this specific case. This is probably a case that will be discussed for a long time and one of the most famous and significant sport law precedents ever, right? So, it can be approached uh, through many different angles, right? I I'll just very briefly summarize the case, and this summary that I will uh, go through is intently laid out to tease uh, to challenge our distinguished speakers, right? And very probably the summary will be reframed and corrected by our guests. This is precisely the idea, right? This case is so controversial, so new, uh, uh, so full of nuances that it it will possible uh, it will possibly uh, uh, be reframed in many other ways. But uh, basically, what will be discussed today is the impact and consequences of the European Court of Human Rights judgment that, by a narrow majority of four votes against three, ruled ruled out as discriminatory and in violation of the athletes' body integrity policies that define male and or female athletes according to the level of testosterone detected in their blood flow and also impose the use of artificial blockers as a sine qua non condition for athletes with natural high levels of this hormone, testosterone, to compete professionally. So basically, this is pretty new, right? Pretty unprecedented and or in, the, in other words, can sport organizations admit or ban from professional competitions women with natural variation of sex genetic features, namely testosterone? Does this comply with human rights as we know them? Well, this is about to our guests to discuss, right? So, Professor Bantakas, it's a pleasure to have you here. Please, uh, the stage is yours. Let's the discussion begin. Right. Thank you, Jair, and thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, no matter you're, you're, you're a 15 or 16 year old athlete, the last thing that you're thinking of is what does my contract with my federation say about a dispute once a dispute arises? And of course, you know, if you go down the line, your national federation has signed the agreement with the international federation, and then that has also come into agreement with CAS for the eventuality of having arbitration there as a, you know, as a, as a, as a last resort. So in all those cases, we we find that the uh, it's I, I would find it's it's a bit strange that the um, European Court of Human Rights has called this a, a compulsory arbitration with problematic features. Why? Because essentially most I mean if not all of sports arbitration is compulsory arbitration in the sense that I've just described. You know, no one really picks and chooses. Athletes don't pick and choose where they go. You can't go to the courts. You know you have to choose 
uh, what your national federation and then the international federation agreement says about dispute resolution is, is that a problematic feature it can be but it's usually not because we have many features of compulsory arbitration tax arbitration in europe is becoming uh, a very common way of resolving disputes and there are others as well and there's been very few precedents where the national courts have said that a compulsory arbitration award could not be enforced in exactly the same way as other arbitral awards. So that's that's that, that's always a feature. Um, now, when it comes to um, to the present case, we see that um, this is clearly a case of forum shopping. Um, could Caster Semenya have gone anywhere else to you know to, uh, to 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 challenge the particular issues he's trying to challenge? Well, she could have gone to South African courts, but they would they would have said they have no jurisdiction. Uh, she could have gone to any country in Europe, any court, and they would have equally declined jurisdiction on forum non-convenience grounds. So, so she went to uh, uh, so she uh, the, the the case went to CAS as a stepping stone to go to the ECHR, knowing full well that she wouldn't be justified before the CAS. Um, but of course, the European Court of Human Rights has a very distinct way of looking at, at issues, and it looks at them through the lens of its own statute, the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, now, this is very convenient to say that because the European Court of Human Rights, when looking at cases with, let's say, a nexus to an armed conflict, only very recently took an approach to looking at international humanitarian law. Uh, again, when, it, when issues come up with cases of economic, social, and cultural rights, then look at them through the lens of, of, of the um, um, of the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, but it looked at them through the lens of civil and political rights that it has jurisdiction over. So that is a very selective court as well. Uh, it's not going to go out of its way to look at things, and it's going to examine everything on the basis of its own statute, even if it's if it's not completely there. Uh, but the ECHR is not the only court that does that. We see that, uh, for example, uh, tribunals dealing with... Um, uh, with issues of foreign investment, ICSID tribunals, they have a tendency to fragment human rights from general international law and so therefore leave human rights out. And so international courts and tribunals have this tendency of only looking at their own statute and assessing situations on the basis of that. Uh, and so it doesn't it doesn't really, uh, it's, it's not a challenge that the ECHR is, is saying what it's saying in terms of, its, um, of how it looks at the case. Now, if we look at if we look at how an arbitral tribunal would have so to, how it, how it uh, kind of imputes human rights in the process, and then I can give you my own take on that, is that generally speaking, international. Um, uh, I've been at CAS for the last five months, so I haven't had a chance to take on a case yet. But uh, as as a, as a as an arbitrator in international commercial disputes, I can give you my own take on that, and it doesn't differ too much from from the from the CAS approach, but. Generally speaking, there is a tendency to 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 argue that um, well, how how do human rights sit with uh, with general international commercial arbitration? And the answer is well, we don't have a lot of data because um, there's been very few cases where this issue has come up before the national courts and the rest of the the, the tribunals uh, passing awards. No challenge have been made, whether good or bad. We don't know what the situation is. But any arbitrator would have an issue applying human rights in a commercial arbitration. The reason being that the arbitrator has to uh, um, abide by the terms of reference of the arbitration agreement, which usually doesn't have any reference to human rights. Uh, and there's no reason why the arbitrator would go out of his way to try to, you know, to infuse human rights into the process. In fact, if he does that, the party will be very angry. And the likelihood is that he will never be appointed again or she. Right. So that's a, that's a, that's a possibility. Now, at the same time, human rights are part of the law of the seat. So they have to be applied, and the same thing goes to CAS as well. You know, uh, the the um, when, when you apply Swiss law, you have to apply also the human rights aspects of Swiss law, and Switzerland is part of the European Convention of Human Rights, so you have to apply that. Um, just to give an indication about the problematic uh, nature for the application of human rights in arbitration, at least how arbitrators look at that. Uh, last year was a conference in Warsaw, and the conference was about the governing law of arbitration. And I made the point that if you have, you know, if if the governing law is unjust, for example, you know, if 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 you have a um, um, a contract with Russia, the invasion of Ukraine is part of the government and tries to change Russian law to have a benefit in the governing law of other contracts, then that would be unjust for the other party because 
it would be governed by a law that it has no no control over but the other party has control over this law and everyone in the conference made the point that there's no way that the tribunal can disregard the law uh, that the parties chose in the first place even if it's completely unjust even if it goes against every aspect of human rights um would we agree with that the answer is i mean as a human rights lawyer and arbitration lawyer i wouldn't agree with that but this is how the majority of my colleagues see the application of human rights in arbitral proceedings um should the cas apply human rights the cas should apply you know human rights to the degree that this is consistent with uh, uh, with justice first of all and secondly to the degree that it is consistent that th this is justified under the circumstances in the case in question anyone can have their own opinion about how they should have been argued in the first place you know was it justified to have the athlete um, um, removed from the games or put in a separate category or should she compete with all the other athletes uh, and the question is by by reducing her her uh, hormone levels uh what should discriminate against other athletes now the biggest question here and i'm sure my, my colleagues would, would answer this and i'm not gonna I'm just simply gonna touch on it i'm not gonna uh, uh, make any comment or not is there any uh obligation on non-state actors as is the uh world athletic federation not to discriminate as a, as a non-state actor that's a that's a, that's a big question under Swiss law and under the European Convention of Human Rights. And secondly, if we were to change the situation, you know, if this wasn't justified to ask her Semenya to reduce her, her hormone level, then would it be justified to ask every other athlete, women athlete, to increase their own hormone levels in order to, to avoid discrimination against the other athlete? So, you know, once against the many or the many uh, against the one in order to bring this to, to avoid any sort of discrimination. Uh, in, in, in closing, um, and I'm giving the floor to my, my colleagues, of course, there are other ways of challenging this, uh, you know, not on a human rights level. And one of these ways would be by uh, making a claim before a national court for restraint of trade. Uh, we see restraint of trade usually being applied uh, for claims by players against agents uh, or by players against their clubs by forcing them, uh, by, by imposing conditions that effectively uh, do not allow them to practice their, their trade, their athletic skills and so forth. So in this case, there could be a case made by Semenya before a national court that she chooses and one that she thinks she has a chance of, of getting jurisdiction to apply for restraint of trade, you know, uh, as, as opposed to going for, uh, for uh, a human rights claim, which I think in the end is not going to help her case. Thank you. Thank, thanks, uh, Elias, a lot. You, uh, your power of synthesis is really impressing. You brought up a lot of very interesting thoughts in a very small amount of time. Congratulations, my friend. So, uh, Daniela, would you have uh, anything to add or discuss on this specific uh, 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 approaches that our friend uh, Elias brought up here? The stage is yours, Daniela. I do. Thank you so much. Thank you in general for um, inviting me to this um, panel um, and discussing this very um, significant judgment. And yes, uh, Elias already mentioned a lot of very interesting things. And I loved the way you said, you know, it's providing a lot of uh, new answers, uh, Jair, in the, in the beginning. And I, I am fully with you there. What I'll try to do in the next 10 to 15 minutes is really focus on what the judgment means for um, the sports world, in particular, rulemaking by by sports bodies, um, and also for the for the topic, which we all know is a very you know topical um, debate at the moment for many sports bodies. But I also pick up some of the things that that Elias mentioned regarding um, the problem we have with with arbitration in sports, and then coming the human rights cases, which is really increasing at the moment. Um, and we also see an increase in human rights being mentioned in these arbitration agreements in sports, actually. So I think that's a very interesting, interesting development, and I'll get to that. But I just want to start with um, briefly the, the implications uh, for sports uh, for sports bodies. And obviously, what I'm saying here is now based on this chamber decision. We all know it can still go to the grand chamber, but um, um, yeah, when it comes to sports bodies, I think 
um, yeah, it's it's important to understand that the judgment is different in the way that, you know, there have been similar cases or, or there have been cases at the European Court of Human Rights before that came through the cast that came through the Swiss Federal Tribunal, but the majority of them really focus on procedural rights or so the right to fair trial, basically. Um, and this one is really about a number of rights which so far haven't been challenged before the before the courts, the European Court of Human Rights, as cases coming from from CAS, from the from the sports world. So, in essence, we can really say that this is, you know, as we said already, the first time that that sports rules are actually being assessed under international or, in this case, regional uh, human rights norms. And that does send uh, a strong message, I think, um, to the sports ecosystem and to sports bodies as well. As for them, it doesn't. Um, it does actually mean that they have to, from now on, carefully draft their rules and take decisions if they don't want them uh, challenged before a human rights court uh, in the end. And I think it's very clear in this case, this applies to eligibility rules. Um, and here, what it what it says is that, you know, sports bodies need to find a way to include and exclude without being discriminatory, basically. So they should think about um, to what extent the rules they want to issue uh, are really necessary, how they're proportionate and reasonable, right? So everything that, that has been discussed in the judgment and then CAS or SFT fails to discuss in, 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 in sufficient detail. Um, but I think it's also interesting to, to think about what this judgment can mean for other rules or decisions sports bodies are taking, or similar rules like eligibility rules when it comes to nationality, right? So we've, I mean, Elias, you already also mentioned the issue of, of um, sports bodies' reactions to the attack, uh, to Russia's attack uh, on Ukraine. So how um, many sports bodies rushed to decide that they're not gonna let um, Russian athletes compete anymore. Um, so how would that turn out if that is a case ever at the European Court of Human Rights? And is that something also where, where sports bodies should actually pay closer attention to, to human rights when they, when they come up with such decisions or they make these rules? Um, and I think what's really crucial here is, again, this jurisdiction question. So the way the court actually reasoned that it does have jurisdiction means that it doesn't matter where the sports body as such. Apparently, it means it doesn't matter where the sports body is, is located. Um, and I think what's also important to mention is that it also doesn't matter whether the sports body in question has any human rights commitment. So whether it has issued a human rights policy or it has uh, included um, a commitment in its statutes. That doesn't matter. That wasn't the case for, for World Athletics. Um, yeah, and I think it's, it will be very interesting to see how in the future then sports bodies will take human rights into account when they make these rules and how they're going to balance it with, with their own sports principles. For instance, the principle of, of, of fair play. Um, and I think it's pretty safe to say there is, as such, no human right to fair play or fair competition, but there is a human right to not be discriminated against. Um, yeah, and secondly, if we reflect on this topic of inclusion and exclusion of transgender um, female athletes or, or female athletes with, with DSD a bit more, then, um, yeah, I think what this judgment could mean for the ongoing debate um, is, is a difficult question to ask and, and we shouldn't be, be too optimistic. Yes, I agree, it does set a, a very important precedent, but also for a long time already, the IOC is promoting their, their framework on fairness, inclusion, non-discrimination on the basis of gender identity and sex variations. Um, and it doesn't solve the, the dilemma, right? Just a few weeks ago, we again had another international federation issuing very strict rules on um, eligibility of, of transgender female athletes um, following in line with World Athletics, with the International Swimming Federation, FINA. I think also World Rugby has these rules. And now we've seen it with the Chess International Chess Federation. I think that's very interesting because usually the, uh, the, the justification that is used um, by sports bodies issuing these rules, of course, is that some controversial science shows that these transgender or, or, or athletes with DSD would have a physical um, advantage. Um, but this is not really what matters in chess. So so very interesting, um, yeah, interesting case here. Um, but yeah, so so what I said is, I think, or what I'm trying to say is that I think it's um, the court to a certain extent declares, of course, that 
as a standard gender-based discrimination should be justified only by very strong considerations, but I think it also doesn't set any universally applicable standard, right? And um, while we should agree that it, it shows there is a way to challenge a rule or a standard that is set on the grounds of human rights, um, it also probably will remain a case-by-case -case approach. Mm -hmm. um, so I think uh, for sure um, this judgment will make or will raise awareness of sports bodies um, that they need to pay more attention to human rights when they draft rules, when they take decisions. Um, but again, let's stay realistic. It's not like all of a sudden Castor Semenya now can run again. Those distances that she was barred from in the meantime, new rules have been issued just March last March this year, actually, World Athletics had issued um, even stricter set of rules. And these are the rules that, that, that apply. Um, yeah, finally, I think I also want to share a bit of a reflection on the broader sport and human rights movement and the meaning of, of this judgment to, to that movement. Yes, it was a very welcome judgment and, and it was celebrated by me and my colleagues. Um, and just to clarify, when I say sport and human rights movement, what I mean by that is this growing awareness of actors within sports and the sports ecosystem of their human rights responsibilities, but also the human rights risks that exist in sports and, and sporting events. And while the majority of sports bodies um, are not on board yet, if we want to call it that way, we do have important sports bodies that have already signed up to, to human rights, that have issued their human rights policies, that have included human rights in their statutes. And that has an impact on others as well. And we see changes on the international, but also national level um, now. And so a lot of positive things have, have been developed from that. Like I said, the, the, the policies, frameworks, but also reporting mechanisms, uh, safeguarding um, concepts. But one of the real big problems still is this idea of, of remedy. So what do you do when actually as an athlete, but also as another affected person uh, or another type of affected person, your human rights have been um, violated in the in the sporting context. Where do you go? And in sports, yes, arbitration is still the key method to go to. But in the human rights world or, or in the sport and human rights world, we do see that also other mechanisms are gaining relevance, right? And, and we see it with, with uh, this case now, but we've also had other cases in the past that were not so day-to-day -day sports related, but more sporting events related that have gone through, for instance, OECD national contact points, with, which is more a mediation procedure. So all this to just say that it does help to, um, at least minimally, to, to strengthen this, this remedy landscape for sport and human rights cases um, a little bit. And um, yeah, again, what I just wanted to say also at this point is, is because Ilya brought it up that because of the sport and human rights movement, if you want to call it that way, you do see that human rights provisions and clauses are also included in instruments that have an arbitration clause that have reference to costs, like the hosting agreements or the, the, the host city contracts for, for mega sporting events like the Olympic Games or, or, or FIFA World Cup. And, and so far, no case has come up. Um, these are also fairly new regulations, but I think it's just very interesting to, to, to think about that and see how that will play out um, in, in, in the future. So yeah, just to wrap up, I think this case definitely helps to 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 um, yeah strengthen this this remedy landscape, but again let's let's stay realistic. Um, it's important to understand what it actually takes from athletes like Castor Semenya to to go through these mechanisms and to reach the state that that she has reached now. Not only in financial terms or, or financial means that are needed, but also just the perseverance, the, the patience, and the, I think, extreme emotional stress that, that athletes then find themselves under. I think that shouldn't be underestimated. So, so yeah, while it does add something, I think it's also always crucial to consider what it, what it takes to, to get there and to reach that state. Um, yeah, and I'll stop here and I'll look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thanks. Back to you, Jair. Wow, Daniela. Great. 
beautiful set, uh, uh, beautifully said. Let me let me tell you that I, I've listened to Elias and and he was bringing up all his knowledge, uh, but from an, maybe an arbitrator's point of view, right? Uh, even though he's a researcher too and has written extensively about all those things. But uh, what I liked a lot in your uh, opinion now is that in your uh, speech is that uh, you you open up the umbrella, right? You brought a lot of other considerations just uh, uh, making even more evident I mean how important this debate uh, uh, is right now so thank you Daniela thank you thank you so much for bringing up so so many different uh, 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 ideas and inputs on this uh, now for us uh, would you uh, please come to to the stage and and enlighten us with uh, I mean some uh, other uh, uh, ideas on this specifically the case I know that you've been writing also about this uh, the stage sure. is all yours for us well uh, thank you Jair uh, uh, this is uh, definitely an interesting case uh, in many aspects and can be discussed in many aspects uh, for example like the admissibility criteria of the European Court of Human Rights and how uh, a compulsory arbitration clause has distorted the traditional paradigms of the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, how an athlete that is residing in South Africa can challenge the regulations adopted in Monaco in front of the state of Switzerland with impacts that uh, potentially can extend to thousands, in, if not millions of athletes around the world. Uh, but against the backdrop uh, of the picture that was drawn by Elias about the difference of you know uh, uh, viewpoints between arbitration and human rights i would like to put uh, the judgment of the european court of human rights next to the award of the court of arbitration for sports in this case to observe a cultural clash between legal traditions between arbitration and human rights arbitration is mostly about uh, confidentiality. Arbitration and human rights do have different and sometimes conflicting philosophies, histories, and principles. Uh, most of the times you find confidentiality, the benefit of arbitration is actually one of the reasons that arbitration is being increasingly used around the world in different sectors. On the other side, a human rights is about publicity. Uh, all international human rights courts and bodies do publish their decisions. They use naming and shaming as one of the tools in enforcement of human rights policies and standards. Um, arbitration is about finding pragmatic solutions to facilitate the process of dispute resolution between the parties uh, to move on and you know, you know, to get a dispute resolved and get done with it. Human rights is grounded in principles. Human rights uses dignity of individuals as a guide in this in its decision making process. No human rights treaty has ever mentioned arbitration. Arbitration was not a source of concern in the preparatory works of the international human rights treaties. Uh, on the other side, uh, during the development phase of arbitration, it was mostly used within a commercial setting or disputes of similar nature. And I want to open a parenthesis and exclude, you know, the investment arbitrations where a, one party is always a state and human rights has been mostly discussed uh, with respect to arbitration within that context. But uh, it was mostly used for commercial settings with, where human rights claims were extremely rare. However, by the increasing uh, privatization of state activities and services and submitting them to private entities, which they establish their own private dispute resolution body, uh, there is a high chance that the human rights arguments and human rights claims who were previously subject to review of the national courts as the main enforcement arms of international human rights law to be sub subject to and submitted to the private arbitral tribunals. Uh, sport arbitration is a prime example of it and probably one of the first uh, uh, areas of arbitration that this clash of cultures has ended up in uh, the pinnacle of the international human rights framework or the European human rights frame framework by taking the case to the European Court of Human Rights. So uh, against this backdrop, now I would like to discuss that 
in front of the court of arbitration for sports, multiple uh, human rights concerns were raised. The principle of non-discrimination based on sex and gender, the physical and mental integrity of person, um, uh, which can be discussed within the uh, concept of the right to privacy in international human rights law, degrading and inhuman treatment resulting from unnecessary medical interver intervention with the bodily autonomy of an individual, the right to health. And these concerns were thoroughly discussed by prominent human rights experts. I mean, the United Nations Office of uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights was involved. The three United Nations Special Rapporteurs on uh, discrimination, on torture, degrading, uh, and inhuman, inhuman treatment on the highest attainable standards of health were involved. Uh, five days of hearing, multiple pages in, in the award uh, is being allocated to the discussion made by uh, those experts. But the response of the panel in the face of all those weighty human rights concerns is basically just one paragraph where uh, the panel discusses and says that we uh, didn't, uh, uh, we actually found those arguments uh, to be, and I quote, not useful in answering the question that the panel wants to answer. And again, I'm going to quote here, the panel says that what matters to us is the rights of females who, uh, who have DSD differences in their sexual develop developments and those who have not. Meaning that the, the, the principle that is guiding the panel in this case is the principle of fairness in sport. And the thing that actually World Athletics is discussing that, hey, we have, we have to, you know, apply these regulations because they guarantee a level playing field for all the you know athletes who are competing um, uh, uh, on on the same uh, on the same field of play uh, later on when they are discussing uh, necessity uh, uh, proportionality and uh, reasonableness of these regulations the panel says and again I quote here the panel that DSC regulations are necessary, and they, uh, because of that, they reflect a, a rational resolution of conflicting human rights. Okay, and therefore they find the regulations uh, to be necessary, to be reasonable, and to be proportional, and uh, they uphold the regulations of uh, the world athletics. The things drastically change when the case goes in front of the European Court of Human Rights, all the concerns that many human rights experts were calling for were pointing uh, were pointing to that, hey, these are these are these are the concerns that are uh, really the substance of this case. Um, and then court of arbitration for sports uh, balance all those concerns against the principle of fairness in a sport. But in front of the European Court of Human Rights, the thing that totally collapses and ruins is the principle of fairness in sport. So basically, the European Court of Human Rights says, if, you, if we are talking about discrimination based on sexual characteristics, there is no space for fairness, fairness, of, fairness of sport competitions, period. And they criticize Court of Arbitration for sports the Swiss Federal Supreme Court for not applying uh, the proper safeguards to protect the rights of individuals in this case. In, in particular, they point out to the concerns that have been admitted and acknowledged by the Court of Arbitration for Sports itself by, by the panel, and they highlight three things here. First, the side effects of the hormonal treatments on, uh, uh, on the individuals, and that even if they follow the DSC regulations, uh, they may not meet the requirements to be able to compete and the weak uh, scientific basis of the regulations. And then it says that when we are talking about the side effects of these treatments, we are basically talking about unnecessary medical intervention in the favor of principle of fairness in sport and that they find that against the international standards of medical ethics. And they also refer to Article 2 of the Oviedo Convention on Biomedicine and Human Rights, which says the interest of human beings should prevail in any type of medical intervention 
over uh, the interests of the society or science. And that is also something that Judge Pavley in his concurring opinion says that uh, in our collective understanding uh, of this case, equality in life is what is more than equity in sports. So if there are principles that are discriminating people and taking away that equality in life from them in favor of equity in sports, we never can tolerate that. And then the court moves forward and what uh, Ilias also described is to the uh, question of horizontal effect of human rights. And it says that non-discrimination is definitely one of the principles that does have horizontal effect and it can be applied to relations in private individuals and the states can be held responsible if they are not guaranteeing uh, this equality uh, uh, within the uh, relations between private individuals. And finally, the European Court of Human Rights ends up upholding the violation of principle of non-discrimination with respect to Article 8, which is the right to privacy. Um, and also, uh, and more importantly, in my humble opinion, uh, that uh, this whole process of, you know, sport arbitration and uh, the review process by the Swiss Federal Supreme Court or Swiss Federal Tribunal cannot be considered as an effective remedy within the international human rights framework because of the absence of institutional, sufficient institutional and procedural safeguards that have been denied to individuals in this process and in my opinion this is where uh, 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 we can find the highest impact on the future of sport arbitration and not only a sport arbitration but every single other field of arbitration that may increasingly face human rights claims because of you know being the ever increasing use of arbitration and the increasing importance of human rights and that human rights claims may end up in front of the arbitration tribunals right now that especially if like sport arbitration if the arbitration is compulsory then probably the arb arbitral tribunal does have uh, an obligation to consider human rights principles ahead of time so that they can provide an effective remedy for the athletes and like uh, daniela mentioned in uh, uh, in uh, her presentation, we see that it probably won't have an impact on Caster Semenya's career. It has already been ended. So uh, at best, we can say that this judgment of human rights is only clarifying principles and is still not providing the athlete with an effective remedy. And that makes the role of the arbitral tribunal more important to take due consideration of human rights considerations early in the career where uh the career of the athlete is at stake the other thing that i wanted to also mention here um, and uh, is really important uh, in my opinion is that this judgment is going to potentially subject uh other doctrines that have been developed by court of arbitration for sports to a human rights review um, we know that court of arbitration for sports has developed other doctrines like uh, the principle of sport nationality, the strict liability for doping violations, the strict liability of clubs for, you know, their fans' conduct or those type of things, uh, or the field of play doctrine. And I think that the field of play doctrine, because of its human rights impacts on the economic rights of the athletes, has more potential to be at least uh, more limited if it's subjected to a human rights analysis in this regard. The last thing that I want to mention is that uh, the judgment of the court also upholds the independence and impartiality of the Court of Arbitration for Sports. However, I think if the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights picks the case, uh, this is uh, an argument that can be really developed by the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights. Because even after the Pakistan case, we see a number of empirical research that are raising questions about the independence and in impartiality of court of arbitrations, whether structurally or whether financially. There is a uh, there is a report by the Play the Game, the Danish organization that has been authored by Greg Hartman. The empirical research by Johan Lindholm on the court of arbitration for sports, and uh, the article written by Antoine Duval 
they all point out to some, you know, concerns uh, that still persists despite the holding of the European Court of Human Rights in Pakistan and the Semenya case that point out to uh, uh, to suspicions of, you know, uh, uh, that 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 court of arbitration for sports might not be considered as an independent and impartial court from and uh, from the viewpoint of an outside observer. Uh, that's all I have for now, and I'll be looking forward to uh, the question and answers. Thank you. Thanks for us. It was really the perusal and the, the how, I mean, deep and uh, very consequently how you examine uh, this issue. Uh, you even gave us a, a, a very good reading of the I mean, particularities of this decision of the European Court, uh, when you mentioned the con concurring opinions and so on and so forth, uh, only the eyes of a true true scientist would uh, lead us, I mean, through this kind of analysis. Thanks a lot, my friend, for us. It was, it was really, uh, uh, you brought a lot of, of, of wisdom and enlightenment to this discussion. Uh, what I would like to do, and, and again, I'm amazed with the quality of the debate and so on, but uh, for instance, uh, Edith, uh, you, you looked at the whole thing, uh, of course, that it was within a very nice context and a very broad context, but from maybe from the arbitrator's point of view, right? Uh, Daniela, uh, brought up some concerns about the, the remedies that we would have um, in, in time. She also mentioned that this would have to be solved in the near future through case-by-case uh, case, uh, methodology and so on and so forth. Uh, for us, you mentioned this cultural clash between uh, the, the arbitration regulations and the human rights things. So, um, considering that our audience is formed also by uh, a lot of practitioners, students, attorneys, uh, ADR service providers, uh, uh, officers and members and stakeholders, I will just invite you in the next five minutes, each one of you, and we can begin maybe uh, by uh, Daniela, to comment on what are the immediate, let's say, innovations, tools, new methodologies, new trends, I mean, from the very practical point of view that we might expect to see uh, in face of, of this new case. Maybe uh, the ADR provisions of contracts will be, of agreements will, will change. Maybe we will have, I mean, sports organizations putting in their uh, 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 regulations and uh, bylaws and uh, uh, documents, something related to human rights and, and so on. So uh, in short, what you see coming, I mean, in the practical field, not anymore in the philosophical, which is, I mean, uh, it's an endless uh, concern and everything, but in the practical field, but very pragmatically, uh, what you see coming out of this decision? Maybe, Daniela, we could have five minutes, each one of you, uh, beginning with you, right? If you, if you think it's okay. Yeah, yeah, sure, it's okay. I don't think I'll, I'll, I'll feel five minutes, but I'll, I'll, I'll certainly have a, have a few things on my mind on that question, and it's a very, very good question. So thank, thanks for raising that. Um, I think um, one thing that that we can be certain of is that, like I said in my presentation, the fact that sports bodies need to weigh in human rights more into their rulemaking will also mean that they need to have more expertise in house on that, right? So, so the the staff that sports bodies have, they need to build their capacity on human rights, but at the same time, sports lawyers advising them, they probably need to get more familiar with European human rights law. Um, uh, yeah, which is which is an interesting uh, development, I think. But I think we can, you know, think that even further to also include um if, if if we think about all these athletes representatives bodies popping up um everywhere um around the world at the moment um we can also see see them trying to invest more in in looking at ways um how they can help athletes that come to them with similar problems trying to go through that remedy remedy landscape and and trying to also help them understand 
uh, like I said at the end of my presentation, what, what is expected from them if they want to make it as far, if they want to challenge the decision so far. And I think just hoping for for how athletes that this doesn't always have to go that far in the future. Um, and I think that will be the case if sports bodies take human rights into account when they already shape their rules. But it also means that on the very first instance, when athletes want to challenge these, these rules, so so the sports body grievance mechanisms that that would then be be the relevant ones if it's not immediately cast right, if it's something that can be handled by the ethics committee or, or by the disciplinary committee or or another judicial mechanism they have in place, um, then also these bodies need to have more expertise. On, on human rights, they need to be able to assess the rules on human rights grounds that have been um, that have been designed. And yeah, like like it's been said already multiple times, um, what was criticized here is that that the CAS and also the SFT um, didn't present an effective remedy. So so in particular, when it comes to CAS, it's a, it's a criticism that I come across uh, often. Also in my work with, with Antoine Duval, we, we discuss it very often, this, this human rights capacity at CAS. And I think you see that um, there are a lot of arbitrators, as we know now here as well, that, that have the, the knowledge and the capacity. But I think the awareness of, of these cases coming and, and then how to apply it to sporting principles, I think that's really something that also needs to um, look more into. Like, how do these sporting principles, like, like um, the, the um, fair play, how does that relate with, with, with human rights? And um, I mean, CAS in the last couple of years has issued these, um, I think, you can call it like a fact sheet or like a summary of, of the costs and, and human rights. But it's not more than a list of cases and a list of relevant rules and regulations. And I think all that deserves more attention. And um, I'm very sure these cases will come. So 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 all those from the sports ecosystem that, that are likely to, to get in touch with this, I think um, very practically, very practically, um, yeah, getting more familiar with with human rights and, and and building human rights capacity is, I think, one thing that that we 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 can add to the list. Thanks, uh, Daniela. Thank, thanks a lot. Very interesting. Just let me ask you something. Uh, you mentioned before mediation. Uh, is this within this context of the disciplinary boards and uh, maybe when the, the problem arises, uh, do you think that mediation could uh, do some good for this these people? I mean, the people involved in this kind of conflicts? Oh yeah, yeah. I certainly, I certainly think so. And and I think my my first thought went more into the cases we we had already um, in in relation to to the Qatar World Cup. We had two cases um, that were brought to to um, a mechanism called the OECD National Contact Points. I'm sure many here are familiar with it. But there were also other cases from the sport, uh, world of sports that actually came to to these national contact points. And I think. Also there, like with arbitration, I think you have a lot of advantages and disadvantages when we when we deal with uh, human rights cases. But I think because this whole remedy landscape is so difficult and challenging in the in the um, uh, sports world when it comes to human rights cases, that I I just think having additional mechanisms that that can p potentially be um, a point of, of reference, a, a point where those affected can can turn to, is is a benefit in and of itself. I, I know that OHCHR has you know this this remedy access to remedy project for a long time already, and one of their central arguments is that there should be a bouquet of remedies available, and I always interpret it in a way that. You know, if, if we have more mechanisms, yes, of course, they, they won't all be good and they won't all be effective, but that's what we then together need to work for. But just having more will hopefully also increase chances of, of providing effective remedy to, to those harmed and to those affected. Thank, thanks a lot, Daniela. Great. Uh, Ilya, Elias, would you like to uh, uh, come up with your comments on that, please? Yeah, thanks, Daniel. That's, that's really insightful. I, I would say that you know, the, the difference between sports arbitration and commercial arbitration is the fact that in commercial arbitration, no one, uh, let's say, um, uh, pretends to have any human rights concerns. Okay, that's the reality. Why? Because if if you if you mention that you want to impute human rights commercial arbitration, you're not going to be appointed, and everyone wants to be appointed either as a counsel or as an arbitrator. 
and, and speaking about human rights isn't good for your career, right? So that, that's the reality. And so, and, and that's why we see that, there, you know, that despite the fact we talk about um, private justice or justice in the private field, there is not a single arbitral statute in any institution that, that even refers to human rights. Now we have procedural rights, okay, you know, equality for the parties, but nothing, that, but nothing beyond that. So if you go back to, to sports arbitration, in order for things to change, first of all, the substantive rules must change uh, in CAS, but also in the sport governing bodies, you know, and not just wishy-washy human rights, you know, effective, effective rights that, 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 that are applicable. Uh, but at the same time, we need to be, you know, we need to be certain what it is we're talking about. You know, we need to appoint arbitrators who are, you know, who, who we're not going to be shy about, about enforcing these rights. And they are actually going to be touting their their human rights um, qualities when they sit as arbitrators. As things stand, you know, with very few exceptions, very few cases where anyone is going to appoint an arbitrator at CAS simply because they, they they're, you know they're talking about human rights. That's that's not going to happen. People are not appointed, you know, in this manner. I was recently looking at um, at, at the World uh, Athletics Federation and um, looking at the nationality rules and. Um, you know, you know, this is what is it? Two two year period where you can change three year period you can change your nationality. So effectively, naturalization through the back door by you know purchasing athletes, uh, and they, they have this this policy which has which you know, effectively says you know that that, that the uh, that, that the buying country, the adopting country, must provide all this information about uh, what citizenship means, uh, what rights the person has, what the salary is going to be, and so forth. It sounds like human rights, okay, but it's really not. Because when we look at the decision, we only see the names, but we don't see the reasons that that the World Federation, Athletic Federation, actually, uh, um, you know, the reasons that drove to providing the, a positive response to the naturalization. So, you know, we, we can dress it up as we like, but in the end, it, it seems like human rights, but it's not. So what needs to be changed is substantive rules in, in the sports governing bodies, but also that these rules will be enforced as human rights rules before CAS, and that people will be appointed on the basis that they will actually enforce those rules and nothing and, and nothing beyond that. Thanks a lot, Elias. I, I liked very much your uh, sincerity, straightforwardness and bluntness, my friend. Uh, that That's what, in my opinion, makes a, 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 a professional a great one. I mean, dignity and everything. And you were being very blunt uh, when you say that uh, uh, Human rights almost never comes as human rights, right? They, they, they. You might, you might dress up uh, the way you prefer, but the, the the solution, as far as I'm understanding, is to really have people that would side and and take a position. Uh, uh, I mean, favoring this kind of issues. Otherwise, you mentioned uh, very uh, pragmatically in your speech, uh, they would not be appointed. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. For us, would you please uh, 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 tell us how do you think that this uh, uh, gap might be bridged other than building capacity, as Daniela said, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, arising, I mean, uh, enhancing the awareness of the arbitrators and so on and so forth. Uh, what is your opinion about that, my friend? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think both Daniela and Elias correctly mentioned the changes that needs to be applied. So. First, first thing first, we have to make uh, changes in the regulations of sport governing bodies. They need to, you know, get consultancy on how to, you know, uh, reconcile the regulations with the requirements of uh, human rights. Because uh, fortunately or unfortunately, it's the human rights courts that are the judge of last resort, right? they are the ones who are saying the last word and the states who have ratified the international human rights conventions are obliged to comply with those type of decisions so yes they have to change the regulations and like Elias mentioned i think we need a change of culture here as well so that the arbitrators arbitrators are not ashamed of you know being advocates of human rights and applying those principles in their practice uh, so that the arbitration community can take away the future of their careers 
because of that. So I think that also requires a change of culture to accept that in the current world, nowadays, many of those human rights arguments that were under the jurisdiction of national courts are ending up in front of arbitral tribunals. Uh, the, to give you one example is cases of sexual abuse in the working environment. With you know the increasing adoption of arbitral agreements, most of those claims are ending up before arbitral tribunals. And if they are not properly considering uh, the rights of individuals and only relying on organizational rules, then we potentially have individuals in a situation that all, all their human rights is going to be taken from them. So uh, in addition to change of po policy, and regulations we need a change of culture that accepts reconciling arbitral rules and human rights uh, considerations and i want to add to that that in addition to that we need the will on behalf of sport organizations and arbitral tribunals to effectively apply these rules we know that fifa for example has incorporated human rights uh, uh, documents or instruments in article 3 of the fifa statute but at least one of the cases that has ended up in front of the court of arbitration for sports and the applicant relies on article 3 referring to his right to freedom of expression the panel says that independently of whether human rights are applicable to this case or not we don't see a violation of freedom of expression so uh, these you know these will this this uh you know, intention to effectively apply human rights in the proceedings is also important, in my opinion. For us, thanks a lot, my friend. Um, uh, let me just uh, tell the audience that all the questions, and there will be many, can be addressed. Unfortunately, we, we, we cannot exceed a certain amount of time, which is ideally one hour, right? But as for your questions, which are very much valued, could you please uh, uh, send them uh, 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 to the email of the arbitration channel, right? Uh, Lauro, could you please, or Fernando, could you please put this, uh, I mean, at the end of our uh, 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 session here, right? And at this point, my dear friends, uh, I, I really, I was the, the I, I was the expect, spectator number one of this webinar. I had this privilege of of, of, of seeing and listening you firsthand here, right? That's that's the, the, the role of the of a mediator, and I could uh, uh, summarize seven different, I mean, uh, suggestions that you after that marvelous, that beautiful discussion over the mainstays of the of this whole. Uh, uh, issue which is really big and broad, but first, make changes in regulations of sport, sport bodies in order to really have human rights uh, uh, somehow contemplated in their laws and rules and, and at the end of the day, uh, uh, effectively applied. Second, raise awareness of arbitrators, neutrals, as well as uh, uh, athletes, uh, about the importance of HR, right? So we need to somehow bridge that cultural clash that Faraz mentioned before uh, by raising awareness, uh, educating people, maybe discussing, putting this subject in the order of the day for us to get somewhere. Change the culture, right? Use all possible means to change a culture which is not working well so far, right? Help athletes, Daniela, to navigate uh, this rough, ground right all these conflicts not only uh, related to this testosterone and female male uh, 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 issue but go beyond that right uh fifth work and create try to create creatively remedies right uh six broaden and and come up with more opportunities to uh, for the stakeholders to discuss and hopefully get to terms before the problem uh, gets too big to be solved, right? It cannot be anymore as, 
uh, and he is very uh, pragmatic, pragmatically said in the beginning, a, a, a matter of uh, jurisdiction shopping, shopping for jurisdiction, right? So it is a real issue. We have a lot of, for us also mentioned that uh, the, the, the concern, uh, Daniela's concern on the sport, human right movement, if, if, if we can talk about this entity so far, right? So it's important to have maybe mediation, maybe some other uh, uh, mechanisms, right? And open the space for uh, human rights to be discussed as such, right? Not under different uh, vests and, and clothes and uh, dressed up exactly as human rights issues. Uh, because after all, uh, uh, nothing that is human might strange us, right? So we are only human, maybe too much human. So my dear friends, we are uh, reaching the one hour limit. I would like just to uh, uh, have your uh, last comment uh, on, on, on this uh, uh, subject. And um, thank you. Thank you so much for bringing up all this knowledge and being so generous with your time and helping the audience to understand such an important uh, 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 issue concerning sport arbitration and human rights, right? So maybe, uh, Ilias, you could just use briefly the, 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 the stage just to uh, make our final remarks and then Daniela and then for us, and then we will just finish the, the session. I hope Cass and, um, and, and, and this federation sporting body don't move to Cairo to avoid the jurisdiction of the ACHR. That's my hope. Uh, yeah, good morning, Ilias. Yeah, no, um, no major mess up. Just thank you, Jair. I think these seven points were, were brilliant. And um, yeah, just a shout out that we're all here to help sports to fully, you know, embed human rights, respect human rights. And um, yeah, we're, we can we can do this together for the athletes and everyone else that loves to enjoy sports as it is. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, no sorry. more comments. I I just enjoyed the conversation. I, I want to thank uh, uh, other speakers who provided their really insightful comments on this matter. Uh, and thank you, everyone. Thanks. So, my friend, close the webinar again. Until the next one, uh, uh, goodbye. Thanks.